This is the third video in a series about this Altair 680 computer. Today we're going to continue looking at what it was like to run this computer in its base or minimal configuration. Now if you haven't watched the other videos in this series, I really recommend you watch those first to give you some good background as to what we're going to be covering today. Uh, to make those easy to find, I have put a link to the playlist in the information below the video. So go ahead and watch those and that'll help you get started on what we're going to do today. Now the minimal configuration of this machine included 1K of RAM and then a single uh, monitor PROM in a 1702 EEPROM and that was just 256 bytes long. So a very simple monitor. And what we found and demonstrated in the previous video is that that's a very limiting environment as you might expect. There's not enough RAM to run basic or to run an assembler editor. If you wanted to write any programs and run them, you pretty much had to write them on a piece of paper, hand assemble them into machine language and then type in the bytes of the machine code using the monitor. And then you could run your program. But the next problem was after you'd done all that work and spent all that time getting it typed in, there was no way to save it. There is no punch command in this monitor. So we got around that problem in the previous video by using another computer that had an assembler editor for the 6800 in it and could punch a tape. And then we had a tape that we could load with a punch program to turn around and then save something we had typed in. But Again, if you had not had access to some separate computer, you'd have really been stuck with the uh, limitations of this computer back in the day. Now we did mention one possible light at the end of the tunnel at the end of that last video, and that was something called VTL, or Very Tiny Language. This is not something MITS developed for, for the Altair. It was developed just by a couple of guys that worked at a computer store. And it ends up being an amazing solution to making this 680 in its minimal configuration useful. It gives a, a basic-like environment. It's definitely not basic, but it's like using basic. Um, that is actually quite usable and powerful, especially given the limitations. Frankly, it's pretty much the same, if not a little better than using 4K basic in a 4K 8080 back in the early days. It actually has more code space available and, and can do a number of things that 4K basic couldn't. But then of course it can't do everything 4K basic could either. It's missing the floating point, but then again, integer basics were popular. Look at the Apple II. So anyway, it's a, it's a pretty amazing uh, solution to this problem. And that's what we're gonna take a look at in more detail as we go on here. Now, the first thing that they did in writing VTL was take advantage of some piece of hardware in here that we haven't even looked, used yet. And that is the spare EEPROM slots next to our monitor there on the left. So you can see we now have three more EEPROMs installed those three EEPROMs are VTL. So those are 256 bytes each. So there's a total of 768 bytes in the VTL program. Um, that's what it uses in ROM. So it is in ROM. If you think about it, it's very nice. You turn the machine on, computer on, hit reset, jump to it, and you're running. So very quick compared to loading basic, for example. Um, as far as the RAM footprint goes, uh, it used uh, page zero in RAM along with what the monitor used. So all of page zero was allocated for VTL in the monitor. And then the monitor itself still needs eight bytes on uh, the start of page one. So 100 to 107 hex is used by the monitor. So basically what that means is that from 108 hex up is available for your programs. So that's 108 hex up through 3FFF. Um, how many Fs is that? 3FFF, yes. Oh, no, 3FF, sorry. I thought I was giving ourselves too much RAM. So you basically have about 760 bytes available for code. And again, that's more than you had for 4K basic in a 4K machine in the day. Um, so let's go ahead and get this computer fired up and take a look about what it's like to run VTL and how it ended up being so space efficient. All right, to get VTL up and running, we basically do like we always do. We do a halt, reset, run. And at that point, we have our dot prompt for the monitor to run the VTL, we just jump to the ROM at the FC00. And we get an OK prompt, much like we get from BASIC. VTL is an interpreted language, just like BASIC. It has an immediate mode, and then of course the programming execution mode, just like BASIC. And when you enter the program, you use line number 10, 20, 30, 40, like BASIC. Um, one of the first things you might have done when you start up with BASIC is type the command print 2 plus 2 to see that it turns 4. Equivalent in VTL would look like this. Where instead of using the word print, I assign 2 plus 2 to a question mark. 
question mark is a system variable that represents the console. In VTL, there are no command words, there are no statements, there are no reserved words. Instead, it uses a few system variables, like this question mark, to uh, allow you to manip manipulate things, control program flow, etc. Um, an input statement would be the opposite of that. For example, it's an A. So A equals question mark is taking input from the console and assigning it to A. So that would be the equivalent of an input statement. Um, assignments you've already seen would be very similar. If I want to set B equal to 1, that does that. Um, Expressions are all evaluated left to right. There is no hierarchy of algebraic operations. You can use parentheses if you want to, but every parenthesis takes a byte in memory, which of course is precious. So if you can avoid it, you might as well. So for example, if I um, did one plus two times three, we get 9 because it did 1 plus 2, which is 3, times 3, which is 9, as opposed to doing 2 times 3, which is 6 plus 1, and getting 7. Um, logical operators are available as well. So for example, is 3 greater than 4? The answer is 0. Oops. Got a double there, let's try that again. And if the result is true, it returns a one. And we'll see how this is used to control all branching and loop structures here in just a second. All right, there's a couple other system variables that are important right off the bat. The asterisk is the amount of memory in your system. You have to set that before you do any programming. So we have 1K of memory. This is so that we don't have to have a memory size routine in the code that saves some space. Uh, another variable is the and sign. Oops, I got asterisk again. Oh no, I didn't. I don't have this down so that we can read, but then the page is not pulling back nicely. So it's and sign. And this variable tells the computer where the program, the user program, ends. And if you recall, the lowest address we can use is hex 108, which is 264. So if I assign this to 264, then I've told VTL that there basically is no program because the lowest possible address is also the end. That's essentially a new command. You type command equals 264, that's a new command. The reason it doesn't just automatically do this when you power up um, or start up is because quite often on these programs you'll use the front panel to do a reset and restart execution at FC100. You don't want it erasing your program every time you do that. All right, so at this point we're ready to type in a program. Backspace, I, I got an extra space there by mistake. In fact, let me just retype that. I have a big problem with double characters it looks like. So we basically have the Hello World program. If I were to jump and say run, it would print Hello World. So how do you type run in, um, in VTL? Well, there are no commands. So the way this is done is with another system variable that you'll see we'll use a lot from here on out. It's the pound sign. Ah, double assignment again. Pound sign, if you assign to it, it tells VTL to go to the line number you assigned to it and run. So if I assign this to 10, it's going to jump to 10 and begin running. So this is basically a run command. Now what you'll find is that it doesn't actually have, actually have to have the exact number. It will go to the next highest number it can find. So by convention, you just put in one, because it'll find the lowest number in the world. The reason one works is because zero is not a valid line number. Zero is a special number that means not to do anything if you assign it to pound sign. So 
So if I assign zero to pound sign, it just continues with whatever statement would be next. And this is how ifs, for loops, do whiles, etc. I'll implement. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to do a, a loop that prints out the line number, let's say five times. We'll use i as the variable. Alright, we follow a string with a semicolon that does not do a character turn. And if you don't put a semicolon, there's always a character turn after a string. Okay, so then I'm going to print the line number. Variables, numbers that are printed, do not print with a leaving space or a trailing space or return. Um, so this allows you to do some formatting. Alright, and those dashes will end up on the right side of the number we're printing, and since there is no semicolon, it will do a character print. So what I'm going to be doing is just printing the line numbers between pairs of dashes on either side. Alright, so now we'd like to increment our loop counter. And what we'd like to do is continue in this loop, in other words, jump back to 20. Um, as long as i is less than, let's say, let's do it from 1 to 5, so if i is less than 6. So here's how this is done. Okay, so we're going to assign to pound sign, which means we're going to tell our program to go somewhere else. And we either want to assign 0, which means just continue on, go on, or we want to assign line 20, which would be our loop. So i less than 6 will return 1 any time that, as long as i is 1, 2, 3, or 5. So what we want to do is, if this is 1, return 20 so that it gets assigned to the pound sign. And that's typically done like this. Alright, so you'll see this syntax a lot in these programs, and you have to understand these are ifs. Anytime you're assigning a line number, you're doing a go-to of some sort. If i is less than 6, jump to 20. That's all we're saying. i is less than 6, we return a 1 times 20, gives us a 20. So this would assign 20 to pound sign while it's 1 to 5. Otherwise, it would just jump to the next statement. Or not jump, just continue. Alright, and to run it. Sadly, I need that down to have a good printout, it looks like. Alright, so there we have our program. And we have a, essentially a do-while loop. We can print strings and do some formatting. Um, and now, actually, this is quite easy to say. All we have to do is turn on the punch and list our program, and it will go out to the punch where we have it saved and can load it. Um, so what's the list command? Well, there are, again, no commands. Uh, what they've done is decided to use the number zero to mean list because you can't type in a line number of zero, so you'll never start a command with zero. So let me zoom back a bit here. I'll turn the punch on, type zero, return. And as we list our program, we are getting our paper thing, punch. All right, I'm going to go ahead and take this offline. Give myself some trailer. And then go back on. Alright. Let's go ahead and uh, turn this computer off. So we're back to the monitor. Jump to FC100, now we're back into VTL. We have to tell VTL the end of memory since we turned the computer off. It's lost all those settings. 
and we need to tell it where um, the program ends currently, which is at the beginning. Got to fix these double bounces. Try it again. All right, so now we're ready to program, and we'll basically just feed this paper tape. Now, the only gotcha in this is that we have to feed it very precisely because we can't include the leading character turn line feed. So this is character turn, that's line feed. So there, that marks the exact start of the uh, program. Now, unfortunately, it does double space everything. There's really no way around that because it's using uh, the monitor ROM to read and print, and it's going to echo all your line feeds. But anyway, it's all in here now. we can run our program quickly just load it off paper tape. So pretty amazingly we've got a decent programming language here and I'm going to show you more in just a minute. I'm going to use a CRT and demonstrate some more advanced programs because enough of this teletype. But um, so in this base configuration we can now turn it on have a programming environment up in a split second, write realistic programs, save them, and load them, all without making any hardware changes other than buying these EEPROMs. And those EEPROMs would be a tenth the cost of adding the memory to run BASIC. So it's a, it was an extremely good deal and a mighty good solution. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do a video cut. We'll take a look at some more advanced programs and we'll use a CRT and uh, so we don't have to listen to this teletype anymore. Now we're going to demonstrate a few more programs in VTL, a little more complicated than that simple program we just did. And we'll run these on the CRT so we don't have to listen to that teletype anymore. All right, I'm in, uh, I'm in VTL and I have good old Lunar Lander program loaded. This is about as big of a program as you could fit in just this little 1K. And to run it, pound equals one. And this is the, the standard one. It doesn't have the graph. That would be too big to fit if it had the, the plot to show you how far off the ground you were. Now this program, even in its reduced size, wouldn't fit in uh, 4K basic in a 4K system. So here you go, in something this minimal, it can actually run. So let's do some free fall for a few burn times. So we're up to 75 feet per second. Still have all of our fuel, now we'll do some burns. We're slowing down. Ah, perfect landing, of course. Um, obviously it's the exact same algorithm as the other lunar lander I've demonstrated on <laughs> other systems because this same, the same uh, sequence of entries works. Um, so interestingly, you can see how much RAM you have on this by just doing a little bit of math on the system variables. We'll print end of RAM, which is the asterisk, minus ampersand or and sign, which is the um, end of the program memory space. And you see we only have three bytes left. So yeah, this, this was a pretty tight fit. All right, to do a new, oops, it's and equals 264. And now if you look, there's nothing in memory at all. And if we did asterisk minus and sign, you see it's 760 bytes total available. A couple of other variables that are interesting. Um, We've seen the question mark for printing. This thing can actually do a primitive string processing capability by using the dollar sign instead of question mark. Basically, dollar sign just passes it straight through without any modifications. For example, let's assign A to dollar sign, and this is doing an input from the console, but it's not inputting it as a decimal number and converting it to binary. Let's type in the number, um, or, or letter, let's type in the letter um, K. And now, we can see what it assigned to A, it's 75. That's the decimal value for the ASCII value A. Um, and so now you can actually just 
put that back out through dollar sign and you print ASCII. And so with the, uh, the array mechanism that you have in, in VTL and this dollar sign, we can actually do some primitive string processing where we can uh, read and write strings. We could echo back a string that somebody typed in. And that's something you can't do in 4K Basic. There's no string processing capability whatsoever. Um, another interesting thing would be the quote that it's a random number. And it regenerates it in between Every time you run a statement, it'll regenerate it again now. So we get a different one. So that's how random numbers are generated. Uh, the remainder from division, let's see, we'll do uh, 10 divided by four, is percent sign. So you can always get the remainder of the previous division by accessing the percent sign. All right, let's take a look at another program. All right, I've loaded another program in. I've loaded the game of craps. And you can see it here. What's interesting about this is this has subroutines. And that's this assignment you see right here is a return from subroutine, pound sign equals exclamation. Whenever you do a go to, whenever you've assigned anything to pound sign, it saves one plus that into bang. So that way you can access bang and return to 471, which would drop to 480. Now this is actually a subroutine calling, it starts here at 500. So 500 is our subroutine. And if you look, um, so here's a call to where we are. Here's a call to 500 right here. So that's a subroutine call. It saves 211 in bang. And let's see, there's another one right here. Here it calls it again, it saves 321 in bang when it calls that. So when 500 executes, it takes bang, which would be three, whatever I said, assigns it to that and basically does the return. So that's how this thing can actually do subroutines. Oh, hold on, let's, let's bet it all. You're busted, okay, so game's over. Now this is an example of a game where there's, there's no way out of it, so you typically would just reset the machine and jump back to FC 100. And this is why you don't want it clearing those memory systems because now Everything's still in here and you can just go again. All right, well that does it for this quick look at VTL. Um, this to me is just an amazing solution for making this minimal configuration of the Altair 680 usable. At this point, I'd be just as happy as this with this as I would have been with a 4K basic on an 8800. In fact, probably happier because it runs so much quicker being in ROM like this. In the next video, we're gonna go ahead and start using expansion boards. We're gonna put in extra memory so that we can load basic and um, in the video after that, we'll actually load the editor assembler and see what some of the more high profile packages were like to use on this Altair 680.